We've all heard this before. Older Seiko movements run fine at low amplitudes. Unfortunately, when new people hear you say low amplitude is okay, that opens the door to too many people using that as a crutch when they service a watch. This whole low amplitude is okay in Seikos can be very confusing for new watchmakers who on one hand, they hear that amplitude should be around 270 degrees to be able to keep a consistent stable rate. But for some reason, that doesn't apply to Seiko. Well, today I'm going to look at the differences between the Swiss and Seiko, and I'm going to answer that question about amplitude. How low is too low? Now, I could only include so much in this short video, but I did write a much more detailed blog post that's on my website, so I'll leave a link to that in the show notes. All right, let's begin with the basics. Amplitude is just how far the balance wheel swings from its resting position, which simply put means that's when the impulse joule is in the fork slot. And amplitude is measured in degrees. So you have a circle that's 360 degrees. So if your time grapher is saying 270, that means that the balance wheel is swinging three quarters of a full circle in each direction. Now, most Swiss movements, they'll run about 270, even up to 310 when fully wound. But Seiko, you often see them come in somewhere like 230, maybe 250. And that's completely fine. In fact, that's where Seiko wanted them to be. Now, if you're brand new to watchmaking, you have probably heard that amplitude is one of the best ways to see and judge whether a mechanical watch is healthy or not. But in Talking about Seiko, you have to look at amplitude in the proper context. So why does amplitude matter? Well, a higher amplitude, it gives the balance wheel more momentum. And that momentum helps it to resist many of the natural uh, faults that happen in the escape. It also helps with things like changes in friction, or the changes that happen during positional variations. So to the point, higher amplitude helps to keep a more steady rate. But there's a ceiling to that amplitude. If, if it gets too high, you know, closer to the end of that 360 degree circle, the balance will start hitting on the backside of the pallet fork and the banking, and that's not good. That will cause timing errors and it'll even wear out and break parts. So what it comes down to is every watch movement is designed to live in a specific amplitude range that balances out power and efficiency and reliability based on what's important to the manufacturer. And in this case, we're talking about the Swiss and Japanese. Now, like I said, Swiss movements tend to shoot for higher amplitude, and they do that to improve the overall accuracy of the movements, and they want to have a more stable rate between higher and lower amplitudes, right? And that's one of the reasons that you see a lot of chronometers with Swiss movements. But Seiko, they went in a whole different direction. This is why you don't see a lot of vintage chronometers from Seiko. The one exception uh, might be the King Seiko, but that was a totally different design, and I don't even think they kept it around that long. Seiko's engineering. They focused on building a tough, reliable, no-fuss watch at a pretty low price point. Think about the 6106. 6309 and of course the 7S26, all of those were built to keep ticking under very tough conditions. Part of that equation was being able to run at a lower amplitude by design. So just to be clear, this isn't a flaw with Seiko. It's a set of deliberate engineering trade-offs that Seiko made 
to difference themselves from the Swiss. Seiko really wanted their watches to run reliably, even after time when they started building up a little bit of grime and grit, knowing that they were not going to be serviced like maybe a more expensive Swiss watch was. They also had markets that had climates that were very hot and humid. So that meant they needed to accept a little bit more friction. They used heavier balance wheels and they dialed down the mainspring torque to help reduce stress on the movement. And the result, they got lower amplitude, but they got really high durability. So let's look at some of the reasons why Seiko runs at lower amplitude from a mechanical standpoint. So first you have the mainspring. Seiko often use softer, lower torque mainsprings that actually limited the amount of force that it had to push the balance wheel. So that's one of the reasons you see a little bit lower amplitude because it can't push the balance wheel as high as a heavier mainspring that's got more torque. Next, you have the balance wheel. You know, Seiko favored heavier balances, especially in calibers like the 6309. That adds stability, especially if the power reserve starts running low. But heavier balances don't swing as far unless you really hit them with a lot more torque. Then you have the escapement geometry. Seiko's escapements, they're definitely tough. Their pallet stones often have a much deeper lock with the escape wheel than Swiss movements. And what that means is that every tick uses up a little bit more energy to unlock the escape wheel. But the trade-off is that it makes it a lot safer and more reliable. But that reliability comes at the cost of a few degrees of amplitude. And then, of course, you have joules. Now, Swiss movement, like an ETA 2824, will have 25 joules. Many Seikos from that era ran at 17 or maybe 21 joules. So when you have fewer joule bearings, you have more friction. Because some of these pivots, like barrel arbors, they're running in brass holes, which wear, and that adds a lot of friction. And of course, that drags down the amplitude a bit as well. So when you put all that together, you start seeing the big picture. Now, Seiko intentionally allowed for more drag, but they designed around it. So let's talk about some real numbers. You take a healthy, freshly serviced 2824. You're probably going to see amplitude around 270, 290 dial up and down, maybe 250, 260 in the vertical positions, right? That's pretty standard. But when you look at the Seiko 7S26 as an example, fully serviced and wound, dial up, you might be around 240, 250, vertical around 220, 230. And that's right where it's supposed to be. Now, those numbers would raise eyebrows uh, if you were dealing with a Swiss movement, but Seiko's okay with that. That's because they engineered the movement to run well, even when the amplitude is a little bit lower. Now, I've serviced quite a few Seikos over the years, and I'll tell you, if I can get 24250 in the horizontal positions, I'm going to be ecstatic, right? That's a healthy watch. And for those who are servicing Seikos right now on the bench, I'd love to see what kind of amplitude you're getting. Leave a note in the comments. Swiss movements are designed to hold amplitude almost all the way through their power reserve. And Seiko's amplitude tends to taper off more gradually before it plummets. So when fully wound, you might get around 250 degrees. And then by hour 24, you might be around 210. But as that mainspring winds down much past that, then the bottom just drops out. And of course, you can't forget about Seiko's magic lever. This is a big part of why low amplitude works. 
it winds very fast and efficiently with just a little bit of wrist motion. So even though amplitude will eventually taper off near the end of the power reserve, most people, they never notice that because it's winding so efficiently, it's always topping itself out throughout the day. So here's what I want you to take away from this. If your Seiko is running at 240 at a full wind, that's not a problem. That's just a sign it's doing exactly what it was designed to do. And when you go vertical, you're going to be pretty close to that sweet spot of around 220 degrees, which cancels out poising errors in the balance. But on the other hand, if you serviced a Seiko movement and it's running horizontally at 200, 210, you still got a little bit of work to do. Because when you go vertical, your amplitude, it's going to drop closer to the dreaded 180 degrees, which is where low amplitude is heightened. And the effects of poising error are definitely not good for your vertical rates. Swiss watches, they chase higher amplitude and higher precision. Seiko, they chased reliability and longevity. Now, which of those qualities is better? Now, that's a personal choice. It's just that what you're looking at is two different companies trying to solve different problems for different markets by making different design choices. So don't panic when your Seiko shows low amplitude. That's just part of the Seiko DNA. And because there's so much more to learn, I hope to see you in the next video.